Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Cesar, for those uh, wonderful words for us. Uh, I hope everyone is having a really good time in Kyoto this week. I have the honor to present our young leader group for 2017 and 2018, which has given us the opportunity to learn from each of us and have the privilege of visiting some of our companies in these two years. Two of our friends, Gor and Hamid, couldn't be here, but their hearts are with us. Arigato. Good morning, konnichiwa. My name is Lisa Henning Beam. I'm with Henning Companies from the United States. When I think about the future, I definitely think about embracing new technologies. If you haven't heard of CRISPR already, I'm sure you will soon. It stands for Clustered Regulatory Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats, which is a very long uh, word, but basically it's a gene editing technology that can precisely edit or change the genetic code or DNA within a specific living animal or plant. This technology is actually already being used with mushrooms that don't brown, genetically hornless Holstein dairy cattle, and even um, pigs with the PRRS disease. I think potentially we could have this technology in our industry for our issue with male chicks. Other technologies that are uh, coming up and coming are the use of black light uh, to reduce livestock odor. Iowa State University is doing uh, some research on this, and they've found that 40 to 100% uh, reduction of odor Robotics is, is uh, very important uh, with our labor shortage issues, so I'm sure that we will be seeing more robotics in our business. Uh, the USDA is even training dogs to now to sniff out bird flu outbreaks by the use of uh, feces and carcasses of waterfowl and other birds. This is a, a study going on at Colorado State University Virtual reality experiences. There's companies in Australia, one called Farm VR, and uh, even the beef industry is utilizing virtual reality. Um, and they debuted it at the Food and Wine Classic in Aspen. Here's a few photographs. Um, you can see the sniffing test going on, the work with the dog training. Um, potentially uh, robotics picking up floor eggs, and then the virtual reality uh, technology um, that's being promoted in various magazines. Sorry. Another area I feel that we will need to embrace is building consumer trust and transparency. You can do this in numerous different ways by utilizing influencer groups. This is some of what we talked about in our first presentation. Um, Industry associations are using blogging tours. Um, the Ohio Poultry Association invited bloggers across a two-day time, uh, time period to come and meet with them and talk one-on-one -on -one with Ohio farmers about egg nutrition and safety. And after that, they had five blog posts that went on, their per on the bloggers' personal websites. Um, social media campaign and contests. You can see from the photographs that the Iowa egg industry during uh, May uh, promoted many different egg events during that time frame. Uh, aligning our values with consumer values is something that we are learning is more important than pushing science. Um, building alliances that carry credibility to share your messages with groups like health professionals and universities and athletic departments, dietitians and chefs and school nutrition associations to help spread our messaging. Partnerships and collaborations have, are also very effective in helping us spread awareness. Um, the Ohio Poultry Association has worked with uh, the Toledo Mud Hens at various different um, baseball events, and the Iowa Poultry Association does the same thing with the iCubs. PJs and Eggs is another event that helps us combine profit and purpose. This is an event where you go and donate pajamas, and they go and help a children's hospital. Another example of building trust and transparency is um, a, a school, Ohio students going and touring um, an egg facility called Infarmation. It is important to um, 
learn about, teach children the origin of their food and the important role agriculture plays for our industry. Also, uh, we embrace uh, the state fairs that we have to build trust with consumers and create transparency. And some of the ways that they have done this is live chick catches on social media and giving out eggs on a stick. It allows us to have conversations with our customers, uh, hosting culinary contests, and even having events such as Animals After Dark, which is an opportunity to have cocktails with farmers and have conversations with your, with your farmers. Marketing opportunities, some of these topics have already been covered uh, by Steve George earlier and others. We've heard a lot about marketing opportunities in the areas of mind, body, and soul. Um, we have a really great opportunity to talk about choline. Um, more than 90% of Americans do not, do not even meet the recommended intake of choline. Um, body, we have an amazing opportunity with athletes to share messaging about the amazing protein in eggs for building muscles and eye health and heart health. And we're actually going to have a video here in a few minutes to showcase um, promoting the health and body aspect. And of course, the soul for us in the United States. Um, Hispanics are one of our largest demographics of, of our consumers. So we have an opportunity to really think about how to promote eggs and all the various dishes that they eat eggs in through that category. Um, in the United States, we've been really excited to have a marketing opportunity with uh, Disney Pixar for a movie that you might be familiar with called Incredibles 2. And it was a very nice um, opp marketing opportunity for the egg industry. Hi, everybody. I'm Bertrand from France. So in France, if the question was 10 years ago, I would say that the major challenge were biosecurity, productivity, automation, in order to do economy of scale and to be competitive on the market. All these points by considering the 2012 European Animal Welfare Rules. <clears throat> now, things are evolving very fast. So, 2012 European rules are completely obsolete, and enrich cage is now a bad world. We now have to face to the same challenge, which is biosecurity, productivity, automation, economy of scale, and price competition. But by developing the animal welfare, when people would like us to do our activity like a workshop. So what do we have to do for the future in France is to be closer to the customer, to educate urban consumers about rural realities, to use new technologies accountable by everybody, to enhance the food industry vision, um, I don't like this word, but we need to, to what the biggest called the greenwashing, like McDonald's, used to have a red and yellow logo and to show them new green marketing development, but now have a green and yellow logo. We have to, new, to use new kind of packaging. We have to communicate on manure treatment. And finally, 
we have to find a solution to leave less place to minority that communicate on subjects they don't really know. For instance, that is what I can find in the internet when I ask, how can I recognize an organic egg to a cage egg? I think there is no comment on those answers. Hello, everybody. My name is Richard Crawford. I am from the UK, and I work for a processing company called Ready Egg Products. One of the biggest challenges facing the egg industry in the UK is the decision by major retailers to stop selling eggs produced from enriched colony production systems by 2025. To give you an idea of the scale of the problem this has created, the total UK laying flock is approximately 38 million hens, 48% of which are from enriched colony systems, and 1.5% are from barn. Therefore, to meet our changing customer demands, the UK egg industry has hard choices to make. We can continue to expand traditional free-range systems, which, has an, which have an image for producing less intensive, high welfare, and wholesome eggs. In the past, these eggs have always commanded a premium due to the higher costs of production, for example, increased labor, poor feed conversion, and higher capital costs, not to mention the additional biosecurity risks. After all, it is not that long ago that free-range hens were temporarily housed for their own protection. This leads on to another option for the UK industry, barn. Barn production can be scaled up to produce a high-value uh, high product that can not only rival uh, production costs, but also biosecurity standards of enriched colony systems. One of the challenges facing barn producers in the UK at the moment is that the customer does not understand the concept. What I mean by this statement is that in the UK, retail market has been clearly defined for some time. Free range has been a high welfare premium product, and a rich colony is a value line product which leaves the customer unsure where barn sits in the scale. In other markets in Northern Europe, where barn production is well established, barn production is actually evolving to barn plus, which are less intensive barn systems where the birds have access to fresh air, daylight, but are still physically separated from predators and disease by using verandas built into the house. So in the medium to short term, I think that the UK market is going to use a mix of all production systems, including enriched colony, as there is still a need for least cost production for processing and food service sectors. However, in the long run, this may be the beginning of the end for the enriched colony system. Thank you. Hello again. I'm Juan from Colombia, and what does the future look like in Colombia? Um, well, in my, point of, in, in my point of view, it's unclear. Part of the population are willing to pay for value products, but on the other hand, some, pro, some part of the population are not willing to pay for this. So, as you can see on the screen, oh, sorry. As you can see on the screen, there are some companies that they are asking now for free range and uh, cage free uh, egg products. But are they willing to pay more for this? Um, the main challenge is that consumers don't understand the difference and don't want to pay more. So we have to educate these people. So the real question is, are they willing to pay more? Let's wait and see in 2025 if they are or not because these policies are trends just for a few years, or is going to be um, a real thing. Um, I wanted to show you a thing that we are doing in Colombia is in the shelf. We are educating people with free range eggs, functional eggs, and conventional eggs. So we are dividing in the shelf these kind of eggs so people can see the difference between these three. So, <clears throat> with the communication as well, with flyers and a few communication things, we, we are educating people about this. Thank you. 
Hello, Jonathan Griffiths from the UK. Um, unfortunately, Gara cannot be with us at the conference, and um, with Richard doing such a good job with the UK, I'm going to look at the future from an Indian perspective. <laughs> Currently, one third of the global population resides in China and India, and it's expected by 2050 the population in India will be around 1.65, 1.7 billion people. Within, within the current market, the vegetarian population in India is estimated to be 20 to 42 percent. Surveys indicate Indians who do eat meat do so infrequently. Only about 30 percent of Indians consume meat on a regular basis. The reasons are mainly cultural and partially economical. With the rise of the middle class and increased urbanization, people do prefer to go for a non-vegetarian diet. How to increase their consumption? Awareness. I know this is an issue that Gora is trying to communicate and change the mindset of people towards benefits that provide uh, health and wellness that provides the eggs uh, for a fast-growing population. Introducing value addition and processing of eggs also helps with the increasing in egg consumption. And I believe that processing is still in its infancy stages within India at around 5%, so there's room for future growth. The Indian poultry industry has seen rapid expansion. The country has emerged as one of the fastest growing poultry producers over the last decade, currently sitting as the fourth largest producer in terms of volume. There's been a steady increase in per capita egg consumption from 2013 at 58 eggs, hope, hoping to rise to 81 eggs by 2020. Again, egg, egg production is set to increase from 83 billion in 2016 to 106 billion by 2020 and expected to reach 136 billion by 2023. Hi, I'm uh, Joey from, uh, from Canada. So what does the future look like a Canadian perspective? Several years ago, the Canadian industry made a proactive decision to move away from conventional housing. As of last year, there were no more installations of conventional cages. When renewing or rebuilding, farmers are, must use enriched colony, free run or free range housing systems. We have enjoyed a tremendous growth in our industry. We've had over 40% growth in the last 11 years and anticipate a further 4% again next year. We feel that it is important to maintain consumer choice for the eggs they purchase, be it how hens are housed, what they are fed, and how they are cared for. Not unlike the IEC, we place large importance on young farmers. As a generation of entrepreneur and young farmers are pursuing careers in egg farming, with close to 30% of egg farmers under the age of 45, there are a number of programs in place to help farmers get a start in egg production. In fact, since 2015, close to 48 new egg farms were added to the system. We are developing a national egg quality standards cert certification to help build consumer trust so that they can be assured the eggs they are buying are produced with the standards they have come to expect from us. It is important to listen to your customers. In the fast-paced lifestyle that people live today, it is important that things are easy. Under that perspective, I suspect that ready-to-eat eggs and egg products have a tremendous growth potential in the future. Building on the nutritional benefits of eggs, especially with babies. We continue to build on nutritional benefits of eggs. As we heard this morning, the importance of the egg yolk in the brain development of babies can't be overstated. We continue to focus our marketing and ad campaigns in this direction. Some of the other items that have already been discussed, and we are running a little short on time, so the, uh, there are some others that I, I would like to mention, but the last one there, it's important to be transparent in the things we do. That means it's important to do the right things for the right reasons. And I'd like to share some facts and some thoughts with you. Over 80% of millennials report making a positive difference in the world is more important to them than professional recognition. They no longer believe the primary purpose of a business 
should be to make a profit. I just want to read that one more time. They no longer believe the primary purpose of a business should be to make a profit, but rather to create social value. That's something to think about. Consumers overwhelmingly prefer products tied to social cause. The pressing question isn't whether managers and CEOs should care about advancing society's goals, but how they do it most effectively. And in closing, the message is clear. For businesses to survive and succeed in today's globalized, hyper-connected world, business leaders must be willing to embrace collaboration as a guiding principle, more so than competition. And Cesar, just before we leave, uh, I want to take this time uh, that the, for all the, the young egg leader uh, class of 2017 and, and 2018, would like to thank the IEC for selecting us to participate in this program. It's been an extremely valuable time for all of us, and we have learned so much and have felt so welcomed by everybody in the egg industry. Thank you. Arigato. Thank you.